Greetings there viewer. If you didn't watch my video about Phantom Dancer, I have realized that movement speed is a very broken stat, alright? So in this game I'm busting out my newest technology, the triple moonplate tech, okay? So the idea here is that moonplate, winged moonplate to be particular, gives you 5% movement speed and in season 14 this is stackable actually. So you can purchase multiple moon plates and get the movement speed buff and just unleash it, okay? So we're gonna build our core build and then we're gonna go lots of moon plates, we're gonna run fast. We have the Yone matchup here in the top lane. Actually, I very much enjoy this matchup right now because previously with Lethal Tempo it was very difficult to kill Yone level 1 or level 2 or level 3 simply because he got too much ability haste on his Q and just basic attack speed from getting lethal tempo and it was not very fun to play against but now since lethal tempo is not as early centric not as um uh, what was the word that riot used i believe it was warping yes it warps the early game because champions that should not be able to beat someone level one are able to beat someone level one because they have little tempo, right? And I know this for a fact. We're gonna drag the minions here a little bit like this. Now what this will do is firstly it will stack up my grasp. I might let the grasp stop, uh, bro, uh, stop, uh, sorry, drop, <laughs> but uh, I'm gonna just hit the wave here. It's very important to get your blade in a good position and have priority on the wave in a matchup like this, because if Yone gets level 2 first before you, then you're not really allowed to play the game actually. But right now I can just go for a Q drag, proc his bone plating. Unfortunately bone plating skewers the early trade a lot, but he's overextending it a little bit. We might get another Q, okay nice. I mean. I was thinking about flashing on him there with Empower Q just to take a good trade. But we can also go for E here. Ooh, Q, got the Q, Ignite, I have Ignite. I think he's just dead. Hey, I screwed it up! Ay, oy, 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 oy. Okay, okay, okay. Man, that was really awkward. That was really awkward. You know what really, like, stopped that play? Like, this is fine. This is actually fine. Like, him staying here. Like, it was obviously best if I don't flash, okay? But him staying here at low HP is actually fine. We might be able to kill him still. I think he's making a mistake by staying. I think he needs to recall. But maybe Hecarim, look. Hecarim's warp. <laughs> I'm using warp now for everything. Just my favorite verb of the day, I guess. And I missed the cannon. Don't worry about that, guys. Hecarim stopped the recall with smite, I believe. Uh, wait, you can't smite th at this level. I think he's just dead. Nice. Hecarim gets the kill. Beautiful. Uh, I wonder if Hecarim is running treasure hunter, actually. Um... Uh, yeah, let's see. <sighs> By the way, guys, I have to tell you something. The reason why I'm playing good in my games now is because I'm actually recording the voiceover after the game, you know? Now, now I don't know if you noticed it in the last video, but I'm recording voiceovers after the game because I have to... Oh, sorry, I, I hit the desk. But, like, I have to... I have to do this because I am unsatisfied with my gameplay when I'm doing a voiceover, okay? So until Master 500 LP, I was totally fine recording voiceovers every game, and I was still playing quite well. I mean, obviously not as well as I would hope. I was only like 58% win rate or something. But like when, when I'm getting to this level of Master 600 LP, and players start being very good, and my champion is not overpowered, it's strong right now. Shen is good, I think. Shen is in a good state with the passive buffs and the base AD buffs. But I can't just focus completely on giving a... Co All right. Let's put it this way. If I do live commentary, I will lose a portion of my gameplay skill. That's just a fact. There is no way I can concentrate fully on the gameplay if I'm trying to give educational commentary or information or like entertaining commentary at the same time. That's just a fact, okay? So you guys are going to have to live with this new format and I think some of you like it honestly and I think it can offer the best of both worlds I'm gonna give you a rundown analysis here why why ooh, well, let's first go for a trade here this is a beautiful trade by the way first using our passive shield to negate all the damage afterwards activating W to negate the follow-up auto attacks and then disengaging only taking the favorable portion of the fight and not overextending it into a position where we might actually lose and if you look at Hecarim's position I, we're gonna have to go help him. I don't know if he can live from this. Mm. Yone is gonna come there, but I might be able to make it in time. I got the taunt on Yone. Beautiful. I don't think I can kill. He's just gonna run away. Um, my Q attack speed was not enough to get the ward during its uh, unstealthed period. 
But Jone is in a checkmate position here. Like I'm in a checkmate. I would say I'm checkmating Jone here because I have ignite. Unfortunately, got hit by that knockup. But it doesn't matter. I'm just gonna ignite and kill. And yes, I'm playing flash ignite now. Like I have, <laughs> I have changed my mind again about teleport. And this time it's for real. Okay. So I, I have never reached challenger by playing with teleport. Let's put it this way, right? I, I am a dirty ignite cheeser and I'm embracing it. Okay. I am embracing it. I have never reached challenger while playing with TP. So when I was struggling now, I was stuck in 500 LP master. I was thinking, okay, let's go back to the basics. I'm gonna run Grasp into every matchup. I don't care. I'm gonna run Ultimate Hunter every game, okay? I'm gonna go Flash Ignite. I'm gonna solo kill people. I don't care if it's theoretically bad because the opponent can recall TP, come back to lane. I don't care. I'm gonna go Flash Ignite. I'm just gonna kill people. That's, that's what I do best. And that's how I'm gonna get Challenger this season as well. Now to give you a rundown of what I think the new format has in terms of pros and cons, right? Pros, my gameplay is much better. Like, I mean much better. I was really struggling uh, playing like uh, quite poorly actually in Master Elo. And then I turned on the Nirvana gameplay with no commentary, guys. I went 11-1 first game. This game, I'm gonna drop a nuclear bomb. I'm telling it already, okay? And, and like I keep playing superbly. When I'm not doing commentary, and that's just a fact. Okay, so pro better comment, uh, better gameplay. The second thing is I am actually able to commentate non-stop. Okay, because I do not have to focus on the gameplay itself, because I have already made my decisions. Right, I don't have to focus on decision making. So technically, I could give a better analysis of what I'm doing in game. Right, that makes sense. Okay, but I think the con is that you miss out on live reactions to stuff. Okay, so if I'm playing for entertainment and I'm doing live commentary, I will have, you know, emotional reactions to plays made within the game. Now, this is not completely erased by the fact that I'm doing post commentary, actually, because I think I have a very, um, how do you see it? <laughs> like, I would say I'm empathetic to like watching replays in the sense that I can actually relive the emotions that I went through while playing the game in this sort of situation. And it's very easy to me, for me to get excited about good gameplay. So I believe that I can offer this sense of like, or like this mix of educational content while also remaining entertaining and then having really standout gameplay. And that's what I hope to do. So this will require a little bit more, more work on my part, obviously, because I have to go through every game again and give you guys a commentary. And sometimes I'm going to fail something in the commentary. I'm going to feel like I have to redo it. I'm not going to do that most of the time, but, you know, sometimes I will do that. So it's going to take a little bit longer for me to make the videos, but they will have better gameplay. I believe better uh, quality and retain at least, let's say, 70% of the emotion that I would go through in the game. And also... If I'm not commentating while I'm playing, I actually play like a machine. Like I, like I actually try to channel this kind of machine behavior where I'm actually not tilted by the game at all. If I'm using my verbal language or like if I'm using my verbal part of the brain, and this is now, I'm, this is complete like pseudoscience by the way, like this is just based on what I've read about, you know, um, wait, this, th there's this book, okay, it's called um, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. It's a book about uh, basically teaching people how to draw. And it's this kind of method of teaching people how to draw by purposefully deactivating like the uh, language slash logical complex of the brain. And now this is like, please, like this is not actual science, okay? But this is how I feel like when I play, right? If I'm playing and talking at the same time, I feel more obligated to kind of churn those emotions. or Not churn, but rather like use those emotions to give you guys entertainment value. But if I'm playing without commentary, I feel as if I am really like in this zen mode where I see no point in even talking because I get no benefit from it, right? There is no educational value in it because I'm not recording the actual live commentary. So what I will do is I will not speak at all. I will, I will have chat disabled and I will have like no verbal part of the brain and I will simply focus like everything on the visual comprehension and the gameplay comprehension and I will be like very in sync with the gameplay, if that makes sense. Like it's very hard to explain but it's, it's, it's a big difference actually for me when I am uh, talking and when I'm just playing. But this went on to be a bit of a ramble. Let's look at the game state here, right? We have a 10 to 3 kill lead 
I have finished Iceborne Gauntlet. I got a little bit of a new build that I'm still testing out, but I, I will give you guys sneak peeks every now and then with each upload, just trying to refine the build a bit more. But let's say uh, I am I'm very confident that I, ha I have found the build. Okay, I'm quite confident about it, but I just need to do a little bit more testing because I'm sure I'm unsure like about the third item options. So spoilers, Iceborne Gauntlet I feel like is a really good item on Shen. Now, I obviously realized this earlier, but since I was... <laughs> look at that Jinx rocket just exploding. But since I was very focused on, um, like, going through all the possible options, because I see that Iceborne Gauntlet is a very clear option, right? But I never want to take something that is very clear, because I feel like you might be missing something that is hidden behind it. So if you, like, think about it from an optimization perspective, is that in... For example, with computer science, people talk about this like explore exploit phenomenon. So you have to use like a certain ah oh, I missed that minion, but you have to use like a certain portion of your uh, energy, time, uh, resources to do either exploration or exploitation. Exploitation means that you use the best alternative that is already available from your current knowledge, right? And exploration is trying to find out something that beats this current best alternative. This is true in fields such as, for example, film um, or like uh, cinema, I don't know what you call it, cinema or like uh, media production, basically, is that you could make, let's say, Spider-Man 7, right? Because you know that Spider-Man movies perform really well, okay? But you also have the option of exploration, which means that you might come up with a new kind of uh, superhero or like new kind of character or new, completely new kind of movie and it might perform better but obviously the expected value on that is less than the expected value of the um, like exploitation option because you know for a fact that there is some stronger alternative available by the way because I don't have bummies yet I'm not actually trying to clear the wave this is like Shen specific proxy strategy so what I'm doing there is I'm simply pulling the wave away from uh, the tier 2 tower of Yone so as to get the wave state in a position where I can actually freeze it, okay? Like, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit weird, I'm gonna go here for the 1v1 Notice here, I am losing minions now when I'm fighting this, but I have ignite so I should be able to pick up the kill and now we're gonna run to the minion wave I'm probably gonna have to ult bot lane I don't even remember if I ult here, but it seems like a position where I would ult uh, because we can guarantee the play I think I'm gonna ult on Silas so that they can go for the dive. And taunt on Evelyn here, so that Evelyn can't get the ultimate off, or any burst off. Probably if Evelyn had ulti, she could get it if she insta cast, but obviously she wants to do some damage first to get the execute buff. Uh, and that's a solid solo kill top lane into guaranteed 3 kills bot side into probably getting the tower soon. Now going for the bummy cinder. And yes, Iceborne Gauntlet I believe, really good item. Uh, let's go back to my explore exploitation topic. So... Right now, I am getting close to the exploitation phase. So technically you would do this so that like, let's say 50% of the time you use the best alternative available and then 50% of the time you try something newer, right? In my case, I feel like I was going like for the first 200 games of the season, I'm going like full explo exploration, right? So every game I'm picking something new, playing it for a couple of games, seeing how it is, so that I get some new evidence on what items could be strong. And I get a very good evaluation of all the items available, so then my information on the items becomes higher quality, because I have more kind of alternatives to combine, uh, compare to. For example, now I know that Eclipse is by far the strongest combat option for Shen, but it's not like for the sake of winning the game. I think I'll make a mistake here, I don't think I can leave this. I can try to kill Evelyn, but there's no way I can escape since Sona has movement speed buff for them. Okay, well we got Evelyn with the flash there. I'm gonna give a shutdown, which is not good. Has 400 gold bounty. So think about that trade as like a one for two, right? Because my death is worth two deaths, okay? Because of the shutdown. It's worth a little bit more, but approximately like that. So it's a losing trade. But at least bot lane gets tower because of it, because they had a lot. I mean, bot lane would have probably gotten tower anyways. So if I was smart, I would probably back off there since I saw that no one was bot side, but I made a mistake and it is what it is. Anyways, I was in the exploration phase, but now I'm slowly like merging uh, into this exploitation phase where I just, I'm building every game what I think is the best build. 
uh, and not even considering new options because I've basically run out of all the items that I feel could be viable for Shen. Um, Ravenous Hydra was part of this exploration process and uh, it was fine, but the thing is, I think that League is in a such like hyper optimized gameplay phase that you are not allowed to build like for fun builds. I mean, obviously, like, okay, this makes like sense, right? Obviously, items that are slightly inefficient will lead to slightly inefficient performance in game, right? But for the case of Shen, the items that are inefficient are in this case the items that I consider to be very strong from the balance standpoint. So items like Eclipse and Ravenous Hydra are like insanely strong bruiser items, like ridiculously strong. So I feel like Eclipse, for example, warps like top lane 1v1s extremely, like in, in a very extreme sense, because there are some games where, for example, I'm 5 and 0, and the opponent purchases Eclipse, and I have no way to fight them anymore because of the shields and the percentage HP damage that it gives. It's very similar to um, Divine Sunderer in his previous state. I'm just gonna E over the wall here because I wasn't sure if uh, the enemies will collapse. It seems like in hindsight that maybe I should have... This is gonna be a little bit awkward here because I'm behind the wall, right? And I have to use E if I want to get over, but I'm still uh, like having some presence there because Sona is not allowed to walk up to chase Hecarim and Silas because I'm there threatening a taunt. So just standing there actually impacts the game. Anyways, my point being that since Shen does not have any AD scalings, uh, you are forced to just go uh, items that have no AD. And since Shen's AP scalings are bad, I feel like you're also forced to only buy tank items. And I don't think this is like uh, the ultimate truth, but I think in this state, uh, it makes sense to just purchase the strongest tank items. And I believe that Hollow Radiance and Icebound Gauntlet right now are the strongest tank items for Shen due to their uh, utility, uh, which is like very high for both items. And Hollow Radiance giving 600 HP, which is really nice. Like the item gives a little bit of magic resistance, 600 HP, very high wave clear, like comparable to, not comparable to Titanic, but like slightly below Titanic. And I actually believe that Hollow Radiance maybe nets you higher CS per minute. Because Hollow Radiance is much easier to guarantee all the last hit with, uh, last hits with. Because Titanic Hydra is very hard to control sometimes. If the wave is crashing on another wave, then you might like unavoidably lose some minions because uh, you can't like choose not to activate the splash of Titanic Hydra, the cre crescent. Uh, it's not crescent, it's called something else. But anyways, moral of the story. I, I think that this three item combination, Lucidity Boots, Icebound Gauntlet, uh, Hollow Radiance is very, very, very strong. Okay, it is very strong. It's also very, um, like, suitable for most games because you are getting both resistance types. And you can... Ooh, I have W here. I should be fine. I'm gonna E and we're gonna kill during taunt. Hmm. Very nice indeed. And, but just look at the wave clear here. Like, this is not bad wave clear, by the way. I'm trying to always put the minion that I kill into the center of the minion wave so that the AoE gets maximum value. And I think this kind of stuff is really important when it comes to, like, you're gonna probably clear, let's say you play 200 games of Shen. You're gonna clear, how many minion waves would you say you clear with Hollow Radiance per game? Then I would say probably upwards of, it's gonna be like two per minute. And then let's say you have Hollow Radiance for 15 minutes per game, which is maybe overestimate. You're probably gonna have it for 10 minutes. 20... 20? 400? You're gonna clear 4,000 waves. Maybe. And if you optimize the minion placement uh, in each of those waves, you're gonna... You're just gonna be a lot faster. And you're gonna be a lot more efficient uh, on average in your games. Um, I could E flash out attack on Evelyn to kill. Bonk! <laughs> there is a little bit scary here, but I have Icebound Gauntlet slow. I will not continue to chase because we have no follow up. Silas is at tier 2 tower. Just gonna chill here a little bit. Notice my double winged moonplate now giving me a lot of movement speed. I would not have been able to kill Evelyn if I did not purchase double winged moonplate there. It is the only item combination with 1600 gold that allows me to uh, catch up to Evelyn there. I mean, okay, if you exclude stuff like Ether Wisp and Erectrix, right? Because like they are uh, like I don't know, they're 
They're equivalent items, but for a different class of champions. We have 15 seconds on ultimate. We're gonna split bot side because uh, our current objective will be the Baron Nashor. So if we can apply pressure bot, uh, Yona should not be able to clear this wave, by the way. Uh, because I can down to him and I can keep going here as long as I get my empowered Q, I will be able to kill him. Now we have killed the enemy top laner. We are applying pressure bot side, team is taking Baron and we might be able to guarantee the dragon afterwards as well. Depends on how the situation goes. But you can see like how strong this build truly is and I, I, I don't think you lack damage with this build. Like obviously, let's talk about the elephant in the room. No Titanic Hydra. I'm not building... This guy can't kill me by the way. I'm just gonna E out. The reason why I E out is because Evelyn can kite me there and charm me and put me into death, into the ground, five five feet under. <laughs> What's the expression? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I can't finish an item here, which is a little bit awkward. This is probably the downside of the triple wing moonplate tech. Probably double wing moonplate or single moonplate is the strongest version of it. I do believe this is like... The thing is, like on paper, it's not a good component, right? Because if you look at Ether Wisp, if you look at Rectrix, they are both items that, okay, I know gold efficiency, not a good metric. But in this case, they are items that give the movement speed for a lot less gold, okay? Like a lot of the items gold budget is allocated to the actual stats. But for Wing Moonplate, you get the same amount of HP as a Ruby Crystal. So you're literally playing four, paying 400 gold for 5% movement speed. And I do believe it's worth... Uh, and if I could build Ether Wisp, I would build Ether Wisp, but I don't think it makes sense. But it's uh, it's something I could try actually. Ether Wisp gives a lot of AP. It gives is it 30 AP or something. So it's something I could try. Now we could recall for for example Warmox uh, or Deadman's Plate. Those are both good upgrade options from the Wind Moon Plate. We're gonna get a taunt on the Asol. Uh, gonna relax a bit. We don't have our ultimate here, Evelyn is gonna kill our team. Uh, <laughs> that's actually something that I talked about with a friend of mine, is that can I E Yone while he is in his uh, E return phase? And I still don't know, like he for sure will not get CC'd if I do that, but I don't know if he takes the damage. I think he should take the damage. We're just gonna get, take a recall here using the blast cones. Warmox is looking mighty juicy here for 2300 gold. And Warmox purchased. That gives us an immense amount of HP, which then in turn, look here, slow increased. Now it's 33% slow on Icebound Gauntlet, and also increases the Immolate and the Desolate passives of Howling. Uh, not Howling, Hollow Radiance. <laughs> Still, that one guy in my YouTube comments was calling it Moon, Moonfire Cape, and I, I kind of dig it. We have Sunfire Cape and Moonfire Cape. <laughs> Scoreline looking pretty impressive, if I do so of myself. 11 kills, 1 death and 10 assists. And let me tell you something guys. For me right now, high, low... Like honestly, if I get a good matchup... I will win the game. Like I'm pretty confident. Like I will, I will win the game if I get a good matchup. Not always, but like most of the time I will win the game. But in high elo, you legit do not get good matchups for Shen. Like, I can't believe how, like, I am so happy for you guys, because you can go into your whatever elo game. Like, respectable elo. I know, like, average Axe Petu elo is, average Axe Petu viewer elo is probably Diamond 3. <laughs> Trust me, guys. <laughs> it is. So, you can go into your Diamond 3 game, and you can pick Shen, and the enemy will not pick Aatrox every game. And if you ban Aatrox, they will not pick Gwen every game. Unlike in high elo, okay? So you are able to play Shen in his very strong, very fun state of being able to be a lane bully with Flash Ignite. I think this is the way to go. I'll see you guys in the next video. I thank you very much for watching. And for those of you who want to see the damage charts, I have included the post-game lobby here so that we can do precisely that. Like, obviously my damage will not be that impressive since I'm building full tank, but hey, let's take a look. GG, well played. Show me the scoreboard, Axpetu. 18,000 damage! Mm. <laughs>